coaches. Today, before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor, CoachPad. Uh, no matter if you draw scout cards by hand or use a program on your computer, CoachPad will give you back time by never stuffing a binder again before heading out to practice. First 13.3-inch electronic device allowing coaches to clearly display scout cards outdoors in the sun has been a game changer for programs this past fall and those currently playing all across the country. This new technology allows coaches to coach and not the monotonous task of stuffing and dealing with binders on the practice field. Check out the Coach Pad and Coach Pad Mini on thecoachpad.com. Please make sure you check out our sponsors, our affiliates. And here is another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast. Uh, welcome back to another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast. Um, today we have the head football coach at Furman, uh, Coach uh, Clay Hendricks. Coach, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good. Um, weather's not fantastic right now. It's a little cold and dreary uh, with some of this rain, but otherwise good. Um, and I, I do really appreciate you coming on because I, I have a couple buddies down in South Carolina, a uh, couple option guys that really loved you and love that you're back at Furman and love what you do. Um, but before we get to any of that, um, and, and how did you end up as the head football coach at Furman? Because, I mean, you haven't been many places, but you've been successful everywhere you've been. Well, I, I, I've been fortunate. You know, obviously I played at Furman. Um, and then, you know, a guy I played for at the time, a guy named Dick Sheridan, who just went to College Football Hall of Fame this year. Uh, you know, my, my junior, senior year would be at NC State back-to-back years, and so they hired him. <laughs> uh, and so I actually went up there, was a, was a GA for him for two seasons. It was a guy named Robbie Caldwell, I'm sure you're familiar with. It was in Clemson all those years, just retired, was my position coach. So I had a chance to get my start under him and was there two seasons, only about 16 months. And uh, I'm 24 years old, and I get hired back at Furman as the offensive line coach. And uh you know, I was coaching guys I had played with that very first year, and shoot, we win the national championship, and I thought I had all the answers there uh, after after a year. But I uh, was there 19 years, long time, and uh, great place, great kids, you know, great school. Um, had an opportunity to go to the Air Force Academy, and uh, you know, I had a number of chances to, you know, do some different things over the years, and that, that place just kind of intrigued me. I didn't really know. Coach Calhoun at the time, we had kind of crossed paths. And after visiting a little bit, I thought that was something that was, you know, something I thought I needed to do a little bit career-wise. And so left after 19 years, had a lot of success. And then we were there 10 seasons. Great experience. Uh, certainly had grown – I'd always had a little bit of option in my background. I'd never really been a pure option guy. Uh, and we weren't really that. You know, really, if you watch them now, they've kind of transitioned back to – yeah. A lot of things they were doing many years ago, but so I spent 10 years there with him and I probably helped me give the, the opportunity to come back to Furman. Uh, I actually had gotten called by Furman one other time about halfway through my tenure there. And I think at the time I just wasn't quite, that wasn't what I wanted to do. And, um, but I got the opportunity. My wife's a Furman grad. She's from Greenville. And, you know, so certainly my connections there, we'd had some success there and had continued to have some success at the Academy and, you know, I had recruited a similar coach, a similar kind of kid all those years. And yeah. I just kind of enjoyed that, that kind of kid. And, uh, you know, and certainly things weren't real good. And, you know, I, I think the challenge is just trying to get it back to, you know, where we were having a chance to you know, win championships, compete for a national championship. I, I was part of the, you know, I was in all three of the national championship games that we played in at Furman. And so I kind of felt like I had a, a pretty good grasp on what it took to, to get there and certainly the landscape has changed in lots of ways yeah especially even the last year or two and so that's really kind of how i ended up back and here we are getting ready to kick off year six and you know we played two seasons in one season and uh yeah dealt with all the craziness that the ncaa has provided us with and uh so but i'm excited we i'm excited about our group we've got coming you know we're about a week away as we speak from from getting going now, I, I'm always interested when I talk to somebody who's coached at an academy school because I think it's a very 
I, and this is me outside looking in, it's a very interesting experience because um, obviously Army, Navy playing each other, Army, Air Force, Air Force, Navy, et cetera, all playing each other is a very interesting, surreal experience because all the, everybody on that field is serving their country um, and will serve their country at some aspect. Can you talk about the experience you had during that time you were at Air Force and kind of what that was like to be able to kind of it, obviously it's a vastly different recruiting experience because you're not recruiting them for football you're in academics you're recruiting them to serve their country but also the experience of playing those other schools and kind of what you kind of brought away from there yeah you know what's kind of interesting you know it's really the same kid academically you know, our standards are really pretty similar to the academies at Furman with the exception of we don't obviously not the military or you know or you're not you know planning for that now we had some challenges I mean we had some things going you know you, you could take lots of kids. You had lots of numbers. <laughs> uh, I think when I coached my last game there, I went and coached the bowl game in 2016. I counted when they had 33 offensive linemen in my meeting room. Um, you know, and so so you had a lot of challenges, but you had some things you had to kind of kind of use to your advantage. And certainly the scheme, you know, was part of that. Um, but I tell people this. I actually have a guy on my staff now, Kevin Lewis, who spent a year at West Point. Um, you know, I, I – I think one of the most challenging things I think I've ever done in my career is, is play in those games. It was so hard to win those games. And again, whether you were really good, according to other people or not, you, know, you essentially were playing yourself. The schemes were really similar. And I think what people don't really realize the option part is such a little part of those games yeah. because everybody's so good at defending it. Uh, they're so good at messing with read keys and, and different things. And uh, so I always felt like, you know, when we had our best success, we could do other things. And, you know, when I first got there, that was, um, you know, Troy was coming from the NFL uh, in his time at Wake Forest, but he had the academy background. And so we, we did a lot of different stuff. I enjoyed that part of it. You know, we ran outside zone. And we ran some power and, and, and did some different things. We were a big formational team. And certainly the option was still a part of it. We wanted to be able to throw it around a little bit more. But, um, but boy, those games just, you know, you know, we always played. Our games were always home-and-home home games with Army-Navy. Um, they have since kind of moved to more of a, a neutral site for a couple of those games. So we, we went to West Point to play. And, you know, we went to Annapolis to play. And they had to come to Colorado Springs. And all of them. All, all the places brought their unique challenges, yeah. you know, by going there to play. And, uh, and then I really think for us, the biggest challenge was, you know, we were playing in the Mountain West Conference. And when I got there, you know, if you remember, TCU, Utah, and BYU were still in the Mountain West Conference. And <laughs> uh, I think we played them three of the first four games that I was there and uh, won two of the three. Uh, BTCU and overtime game, but just incredibly challenging. And then I think, you know, I'm an old offensive line coach, all three of those head coaches, you know, um, you know, Gary Patterson and, and Kyle Whittingham and, and uh, uh, BYU, they were, you know, all three head coaches were defensive guys. Yeah. So you knew they were going to be prepared for you and they're going to have a plan. And, um, and then all of a sudden you're going through that stretch. And oh, by the way, okay, we had to Annapolis this week to play. <laughs> it was a non-conference game. And then we're back in the conference. And then later in the year, here comes Army. Um, so I think that's what made it incredibly challenging. You know, we just didn't get a chance to play many people where we felt like they were really unprepared. Yeah. Um, or they just didn't see it. And, you know, I, in my opinion, when you look at it now, a little bit of what's happened to Navy, I truly think, is – they went into that league, who obviously is a lot more talented than they are. It's just the nature of the beast. And now those people will see them every year. Yeah. And you know, they lose a little bit of their, you know, the nuance of what they do. And then, you know, Army's been able to stay, you know, independent. Uh, their schedule changes much more. And they've done a great job. But it's, you know, it was always a lot more fun when you had somebody you knew wasn't quite as dialed in, you know, to what you were doing. Yeah, and how you were doing it, and the, and the, you know, the mindset that it took to even go you know, play against the option. Yeah, a perfect coach. Now, kind of from there, I mean, like said, so you left Air Force to come back to your alma mater, and I mean, your alma mater had 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 a couple of years where they'd struggled a little bit, uh, to put nicely, and um, you came in and kind of, I mean, we talked off screen and just look at the record. I mean, you had some pretty instant success 
or at least a great turnaround. I mean, we talked two of the first four years you made the playoffs. I mean, obviously that, and then COVID hit and all that, that unfortunate jazz, but talk about like, I mean, when you got to Furman, I mean, you kind of knew the expectation. You'd coached there before, you'd played there. But what when you got there, what did you say, hey, we need to fix this, or this is like, this is what I need to implement to get us back to where we need to go? Well, I, you know, I felt like for me, you know, the toughness aspect and, and the run of the football and, and certainly defending the run and it become a, probably a team that's throwing it around quite a bit and it just lost a little bit of our identity or, or maybe it just didn't truly have an identity. And so that's where it started, you know, and I hired some people, um, you know, I hired a guy named Drew Cronick, who's now the head coach at Mercer and Drew's background largely was in wing T. Uh, and I, it really, in my mind, I still wanted to kind of blend some of the option stuff with some of the more direct runs being an outside zone team. I want to be able to recruit tailbacks and I want to be able to recruit receivers. <laughs> and, you know, we were fortunate the first year. Um, we had a really good quarterback. We had a fifth year kid named PJ Blazejowski who was really talented. He could make throws. He was athletic. And, you know, I think we had a little bit of a benefit of catching some people a little bit unprepared. I remember people thinking, you know, saying stuff to us, man, y'all are running like three offenses. And, you know, we, we had a couple of we had a couple of pretty good backs. I knew we weren't very good up front. And I felt like even with Drew, some of the stuff we could do, you know, the belly and some of the gap stuff could help, you know, maybe help us. I mean, be honest, we help us make a few more first downs Yeah, and, you know, help us be competitive. Well, the next thing you know, we, you know, you know, we, we start 0-3 and, and I think we lose two of the three games on the last play of the game. Uh, but we had played pretty well and been really competitive. And then, I don't know, we got to playing pretty good. Um, had a chance, win a playoff game, go to Elon and win a playoff game. And then um, had to play a really good Wofford team who we had gone for two to beat in the first game of the year again at their place. And, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, we ended up playing. We had a fifth-year senior, never played the second year. And, you know, Drew – leaves and goes to Lenora and takes the offense coordinator job and George Quarles slides in that position. We kind of kept doing, I liked what we were doing. We did some things changing a little bit with the system. Um, and then, you know, then we, we went a couple of years playing with, with a couple of young quarterbacks and, uh, but I thought we had recruited pretty well. We had played really solid defensively. And, um, uh, and I, I think the biggest thing we changed just, uh, as, as you hear a lot of people say, just the culture, so to speak. And uh, you guys just bring the, 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 the toughness and the attention to detail and, and those type things. And, I, and that, that's been a pretty good formula for us. We had really bright kids yeah. uh, and high character guys. And, uh, you know, I knew they would work. And, and, uh, and again, I thought we did good. I thought we've done a good job of getting kids to firm and, not everybody's going to be successful at our place, largely because of the academic side of it. You know, so just, again, finding, you know, staff that, that fits here. And I thought we did a really good job with that. And then and then finding kids that could be could be successful here. Now, now the other thing you've mentioned kind of as we started is, obviously, when you were at Air Force, Army, Navy, you mentioned how well each of those teams defend the option because that's what they know and what they run. Um but you, I mean, kind of, I mean, how much say do you, cause you obviously see the Citadel um, and you see Wofford who runs a gun version of it. When, when you're talking with your defensive staff, as you prep for those games, how much do you get involved in that? Given your experience, not only coaching and your variation at air force, but also playing army and Navy every year when you were back yeah. there, how much do you yeah. have a conversation or do you bring your expertise? Because obviously you lived in that world for a good, a good period of time. Well, I tell you what I did, and I've done this with, I've had friends in coaching over the years and, and maybe that I helped as well that played some teams that were doing some of that stuff. So a little more from a consulting type aspect of it, you know, really my approach was a little bit more, if you do this, this is what they're going to do. And, you know, Rocky Long used to say it out when he was at New Mexico and San Diego State, he said, you know, you can't, you can never win on paper. Because you've always got an answer, you know, no matter because in the day it comes down, can you can you can you make blocks, can you beat blocks, you know, and, and you can you can you execute because you, you can always gain a hat, you know, somewhere. But 
you know, there's a little, you know, there's a little book that they, everybody kind of goes by that, that, you know, if you, if you, if you see certain structures, you know, you're going to see certain plays and, and the, the opposite is true. If you see certain structures, they're not going to do certain things against you. Uh, you know, the formation part, you know, they're always trying to gain a hat. Uh, you know, the unbalanced stuff, the adjustments, you know, we were always going to, you know, in the first 10 plays of the game, you're going to do enough stuff to show them to see out, see if they really, as we used to say, can they count, you know, do they, do they know, can they make the adjustments? Can they cover the eligibles? You know, that, that type stuff. And so I've tried to always approach it a little bit more from, from that side of it. Um, Cause there's lots of ways to do it. You know, a lot of people think, you know, these academies, they're all play. you know, or at least they were, everybody's playing an odd front. Well, that's what we ought to do is play an odd front. Well, odd front's pretty good, pretty good defense against triple option if you know what you're doing, uh, you know, but you still got to be willing to, your kids got to be willing to get in the fight and do the dirty work. And, uh, you know, those defense fans need to realize that week, they're not going to get a lot of chances to rush the passer. Uh, and, and so they need to, you know, they just have to buy. And I think the other thing you got to do is you just got to, you got to spend time year round. You know, we invest, we invest in the spring. We'll certainly invest a bunch of time in the, you know, in the preseason, um, you know, for some of those teams that are a little bit unique. Uh, and, you know, it's going to be really interesting with the new rule, you know, the new cut rule, uh, you know, how that's going to affect some of those teams. Um you know, we had we had kind of a rule in place, and they didn't ever call it. So I don't I don't know why we didn't come up with a new rule. Uh, you know, and I'm always a guy that's like to block low at, at times when you could. You know, we still do some of that, but uh, but I, it, it, it's going to be interesting to see how the new rule affects them. Yeah, I agree, and that, that and that's been. A, hey, and I'd be willing to tell you that somebody that probably plays one of those three teams has a pretty good vote on the rules committee. And I don't know that, but I'd be willing to bet you somebody had a say in the rules yeah. committee. I know for a fact it happened earlier when the last time they made the rules change, somebody was getting to play one of those teams every year. And they, yep. got a little, they got a little pull, I guess, when it comes to getting some rules changed. But it, but really that rule just harkens to what most of us high school coaches are stuck with. And there's, you still, still see the option. You just have to make some adjustments here and there. Like we can't, I mean, like here in Ohio, if you're not immediately on the line of scrimmage, we can't cut you. Like we can't right. cut down field. We can't cut down field. If you delay, if you are a late blitzer, we can't cut yet. So, I mean, it really, it's just, I mean, you're now adapting to high school rules essentially. Um, well, and, and I, I tell you the frustrating thing for me a little bit, in all my years, I just really sitting here thinking, when did you hurt somebody on a low block? I, I just, I, I I can think, you know, I've been doing this 37 years and I've probably run some option every single year of the 37 years, some more so than other. And I'm just trying to think how many times did we ever hurt somebody? Yeah. And, and so I, I don't know, it's just a little bit of reaction, you know, it's like I said, you learned to defense guys learned it. You know, Gary Patterson used to say that he just thought it made their team better having to play air force. And, you know, you, the same old thing you bend your knees and use your hands move your feet you don't get cut and you're probably a better football player you know but i but it's just that's just the way of the world right now really a lot of things now you also mentioned on there and you mentioned it a couple of times obviously i mean you started at Furman, you had your option experience but it, you guys weren't i'm not gonna say at you weren't as heavy or hardcore option during your tenure at Air Force, say, as a Navy had been. Right. Um, and you kind of run other things like power, like wide zone. Um, and then obviously you've now transitioned to firm in the past several years. And like, if anybody turns you on, I mean, you're rarely under center, if ever at all. You are, I mean, you run various schemes out of your, your gun, gun offense. What, what, is, what is your, and you kind of mentioned a little bit on when you first got there and you've hired your offense coordinators, what has your offensive evolution been like? And, and you kind of mentioned part of it's because you won't be able to recruit running backs and receivers. But why have you kind of gone the direction you have over the course of your career? Well, you know, when, I, when we got to the academy, maybe even when I was at firm before, you know, generally when you're a place, you, know, you think about the places in the country that we probably are similar to, you know, it's, 
it's Stanford's, it's Northwestern, and it's Duke some of the, from an academic standpoint. So you, you're not going to be the most talented when, when that's part of the equation. It's just, that's just the nature of the world a little bit. And so, um, you know, I always felt the option gave us a little bit of a, a little bit of a, of a, of an advantage, being able to make people defend it. Um, uh, I think when we got, when we got to air force, you know, you weren't going to have as good of players as everybody else. You weren't going to have as much team speed. So you're always looking for e equalizers. And so largely, uh, and I think the combination of that, and then you're playing against people. When I, when I got there, we're playing against people that, that had a pretty good plan for you. You know, they practiced for you year round. So then we felt like, well, we couldn't just be triple. You know, we had to be able to mix it. And, and do different things. And so I carried that same kind of thought when I came back to Furman. You know, initially it was, I knew we weren't as talented as we need to be. Um, and you know, what gave us the best chance to compete right away? And it was, you know, being hard to prepare for, not being real fun to play against or to prepare, you know, or to prepare for. And certainly the option was a little bit of phase of that, using a fullback, um, giving our linemen the ability to, you know, put their hand on the ground and come off the ball. And then I think as we've gotten a little bit better players, I think now, uh, you know, now as you deal with the world of transfer and, and all this other stuff, uh, I, I know we've even the talent gap much more so. So you felt like you could do a few more of the traditional things. You weren't having to try to do things to always create an angle or, or, uh, you know, there, there's times, you know, just trying to find ways to move the chains. And, and again, I think that the world of, of college football, football, just about anywhere. I can remember lots of years when I think our goal years ago was scored 21 points a game. And if we were scoring 21 points, we were winning a lot of games. You know, you score 21 now, sometimes you may not win many games. And it used to be you could win a lot of games. You know, Georgia probably this year, you know, they're probably the one team that showed you could win just playing defense. But it's hard to win games just playing defense anymore. You got to be able to score, you know. And, um, and again, you know, everybody's bigger and faster and trying to spread people out a little bit. And, you know, so really it's just maybe a little bit how we've presented it yet still keeping the physical element, and, you know, and obviously the way of the sport. Um, I don't know. There's, there's probably a lot of people who want to throw around a little bit more, maybe not play the physical side of it. And you try to use that to your advantage, you know, a little bit when you play, but again, at the end of the day, you have to be productive. And you, you mentioned the physical part there. Obviously you spent a long time in the trenches. You played, offensive line you you I mean heck, heck you you learned under Robbie Caldwell um you you heck you've coached offensive line for over 20 plus years and that's kind of who you've been what what do you when you're coaching offensive linemen because you've you've coached a bunch of all conference offensive linemen over the course of your career I mean what where do you kind I mean how do you approach coaching offensive line where is your perspective there and then is there anything you, any advice you can give to high school coaches when in terms of come to coaching offensive line? Well, I, you know, I'm still a big believer in, in leverage and, and uh, you know, there's still a, a huge thing with low man wins. And, you know, it was, uh, I learned it way back, just the details of the position, um, you know, gave guys a chance, maybe they weren't as talented to compete. Uh, you know, I always liked the athletic guys. It could bend and run and, you know, again, could play with really good pad level. And uh, as we've gotten a little bigger, still like athletic guys, uh, you know, it's fun. It's been interesting for me, even in the time that I've been back. And I just actually hired a new guy this year, Matt McCutcheon. Who is funny, Matt, when you go back and look at him, he was at East Tennessee a year ago. They had, you know, had a kid led the country in rushing, and I was always impressed with what they did, and probably because I felt like they did things kind of the way we like to play, and they were physical. And, you know, Matt played two years at the Naval Academy and then spent three years, you know, going to Kentucky and started for Kentucky for three years, and it's been kind of fun for me to be around him just to, uh, I, you know, I'd always tried to learn from people and, uh you know, but it, it's been kind of interesting, you know, worrying a little bit more about length than I remember ever worrying about that before in the past. And, you know, it's not going to be the end all to end all, but 
some of that, um, you know, has always been kind of, you know, kind of, kind of maybe been pushed to the side a little bit, but uh, it, it's been fun for me to feel like I could sit back and watch a little bit more so and, and still learn. I, I remember having, I had about three moments in my coaching career that, that really kind of changed me. Uh, you know, one of them was when Milt Tenniper wrote a book called The Assembly Line. Uh, you know, Milt Tenniper was the old Nebraska guy. And I don't know when this was probably in the early 90s. I was a young, young coach. And, you know, the whole, you know, we had been largely a man blocking scheme and, and man a little bit of gap. And was, everybody played one defense. And all of a sudden people started moving around, you know, and, yeah. and the whole zone, you know, the whole zone concept came. And it was the combination. You know, you think about the heyday of Nebraska football, it was option power uh, and a little bit of zone. Uh, and then the next time it kind of hit me was hearing Alex Gibbs for the first time. I hear him at, uh, at, a, at a clinic, a Gilman dinner at the National Convention. I get the tape later, and this was the heyday of the Broncos and Terrell Davis and, you know, outside zone. And uh, I remember getting the tape and, and just kind of, committed to you know and, and again i'm not even sure what the time was well then you know i get the air force and troy had spent you know a couple of years with the broncos and had been around alex gibbs and you know he and i kind of kind of did a lot of things similar kind of believed in the same thing but you know that was two times it just kind of really probably those two and then my time spent at the academy where we did a lot of stuff were really kind of changed your thinking a little bit and then and then really probably in the last year or two, you know, just hired a new offense coordinator. Justin Roper came from Holy Cross and Justin's had a unique background and um, it's been kind of fun for me, you know, as we've had some, had some changes and we still, I think, believe in doing it. We all kind of believe in doing the same kind of things, but we're maybe presenting it a little bit different way. Uh, you know, I think we all do have to be a little open to change a little bit. But the change has been good for us. I, re I really kind of enjoyed that part of it. Now, the other thing you mentioned, and I wasn't even going to go this direction, but you've mentioned it several times. You mentioned wide zone several times and your love affair with with that during this. Why why wide zone? Why why is I mean everybody's different on what their like favorite play is or or play that they're yeah, obsessed yeah. with or they, or they really want to make work. Like everybody's well, different. Why? Well, you know, it's it's funny to hear you say this because you know the first thing that goes to my mind, you know, because you hear you hear outside, you hear wide. You hear me and you hear all this, you know, and sometimes it's, it's, yeah. it's, I know, show me exactly which one you're talking about. <laughs> and, you know, some people, ours is probably more of a mid zone, you know, yeah. than, than, than true wide, but, you know, it's funny for us. I liked, um, you know, when, when, when Alex Gibbs was doing it, you know, they were relatively undersized for the NFL. You know, he had a bunch of athletic guys. I thought it kind of fit us and who we had. Uh, it's funny. I was talking to Billy Napier that, you know, Billy, down in Florida had, had, had uh, played for us, you know, in the early 2000s there. And we had some really good teams. And it was probably about in through that time was when a bunch of that started. Um, but I, I just felt like we could use our athleticism, but we could play really fast and still be physical. And I thought the pad level part. And, you know, the, the cutting stuff on the backside, uh, I, that's part of who we were. And yeah. that's still who, part of who we are. And and uh, and we had largely been under center, and we've kind of evolved and done some of, done some of the both, the pistol and the, and the other. But uh, and then the boot came off. I mean, I just felt like it fit us, you know. And um, and I, I I think there's a lot of years when we were coaching those guys. All right, guys, you got one call. We got one call. We got to make this. What do you want to do? And I think probably most of them would tell you that. Uh, you know, I think in those days we called it stretch. Uh, so it's a little bit, a little bit of what the verbiage is, but, uh, yeah. you know, but we just, you know, and having backs, I thought it was a little bit easier to teach those backs and, and, you know, they could press it and get downhill and again, allow you to be physical. And, you know, it's, it's been good for us over the years. And there's times I fought, you know, Troy, there's times, you know, I don't know, you, you know, I think you learned, you know, if you're doing it, you can get a couple more holding calls, even though they don't call holding in college football anymore. But you're gonna get a couple of hold, more holding calls. You're gonna have a few more negative plays, but I just think the bang for your buck. I mean, you had had a chance to get a lot of big plays, and then the boot game. It, it was worth it, you know, to me. To and I, I experimented for years trying to. There was one year I remember, efforts we tried to 
really split it out and see how, just how much we could press, you know, the gap, you know, you know the splits. Yeah. And then I learned pretty quick, you couldn't close seams and uh, it create, you know, you had to be a little careful with what you're trying to do there. Um, but I, you know, I still enjoy, I, I still enjoy that aspect of it. Good coach. No, I'm curious. Cause I, like I saw every time you, you, I mean, you keep bringing it up and like, you just look excited. Like I love coaches that have something they're really excited about. Like, yeah. it's not, like I, cause I've worked for guys who love power, like to know yeah. and it yeah. will work and they will find a way to make it work. So yeah. Yeah. And, and I've liked power. I just, I don't know. I think I've ever been anywhere where I just felt like I had guys, Yeah, you know, just physically that, that could do that. And again, I felt like, great conversion thought and it brought you something but i just didn't feel like the bang for the buck was mm-hmm. was quite the same um i get it yeah no, perfect coach seriously no perfect um kind of, and you've mentioned this also a couple of times like hiring a staff like because you you've you i mean again you've had one coach leave for mercer become a head coach like i mean what when you're looking to hire somebody because i'm always curious about this when i as a, as a head high school head coach myself when you're looking to hire somebody, what, what do you kind of look for? Is there any particular questions, like something that you really want to get to know? I, I know some of it kind of our profession is, okay, do we know somebody that knows somebody that kind of helps that? Or is right. some, somebody we've worked for, or somebody that's played for us, that, that makes it a little easier for us because we know who they are or they a good recommendation. But when you're looking to hire somebody, what do you kind of look for? Is there anything particular you want to know, et cetera? Well, yeah, I really, I like to think I'm, I'm pretty particular about how I like to do it. I mean, obviously we all want to be comfortable with people and certainly it's great when you know somebody that, that, you know, um, but you know, for me, I, I think it's just hiring really good people. Um, obviously they've got to be really good at what they do. And I did a little study of this stuff this, this, this summer, as a matter of fact, just, just the team aspect in general. And, yeah. and a little bit of it was, it started with, you know, people or just hiring talent and be the same way with your team. But obviously guys need to be good at what they're doing. They need to fit at our place. Um, you know, our place is a little, you know, when you look at a transcript, you can look at it a little different and that's going to be a problem for you. Then this is probably not the place to come work. You know, if you don't complain, you know, this is what they got to have, you know, and, and when you have that borderline guy, you got it. Then you got to decide. You know, can he can he make it here? Can he basically? I, you know, and I learned this at the academy too. If they're struggling in school, they're going to struggle on the field. And so I think for us, it starts with that. But just just uh, I think the staff morale part, just getting guys that fit. You know, your staff, and uh, you know, I, I uh, we've tried to create an environment here where you can be a family guy, you can be a good dad, you can be a, you know, a good husband and you can have a life outside of football. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to work hard while we can, you know, while we're there and, and then you're going to go home. And uh, I just think you'll, you'll coach better. Your wife will be happier. Your kids will be happier and just everything will be better, you know, and yet you got, you got, you got, you got to know your stuff. And, and I think the other thing is building off people's strengths. You know, you and I were laughing about, you know, my technology skills are not real good. So I, you know, when I first came here, I had two academy guys. Uh, one of them's now at Harvard Law School. My, my initial offensive line coach is now at Harvard Law. Uh, so I just like hiring, you know, and I'll say I learned this from Troy. You know, you hire really bright guys that are good workers, and I think they figure it out. Uh, and I think those guys, and you know, sometimes those couple of guys – one of them's back at Air Force now. Uh, you know, they would uh, provide them a little guidance, a little bit of leadership, and and uh, you know they'll they'll kind of figure it out. It's kind of fun to watch them watch them grow, and then trying to have a little bit of a mixture of some older guys with some younger guys. I think that keeps. I know the young guys. I've enjoyed having the young guys around me too. Uh, I remember when I was the youngest guy. I'm not the oldest guy, but I'm close. And, uh, <laughs> But I, I just think for me, that's, I, I still, in, in this whole profession, for me, it's who do I get to work with? I get to make that decision, I guess. Yep. And who do I get to coach? I get to make that choice too. And can you win? Yeah. And those are the three things that really drive everything I do. And, and, uh, and certainly we live in a great place and, and all that aspect of it, but I just enjoy going to work. And you know what? Um, uh, 
we're not gonna win every game. We haven't. And, um, I like to think I'm the same guy when we don't win. Is you know we all have our moments, but I, I just I just that's kind of what's gonna drive me. You know, and, and the people I get to work with, and I get the kids I get to coach, and and you know it's tough work. So you won't have a chance to go out there and and win. And that doesn't mean it's easy. And it doesn't mean you're gonna have the same thing everybody else is gonna have. But you know, but for me, that's kind of what drives me. The other thing I, I like to ask either current or former O-line coaches, just because I'm always curious, because everybody's got a different perspective on it. And, I mean, from your time as an offensive line coach, what was your favorite O-line drill that you, you did? Wow. Uh, you know what? I had a I had a little – it's funny. that I did this – you know, I did it for 29 years. Yeah. Uh, I was an O-line coach for 29 years. And uh, I went from being a surface blocker. I remember when, that's what I, that's how I was taught largely. And I was there when the rules transition with a hand step as a player. Um, and, you know, I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed that part of it. Just the old, a lot of it is just the old board drill stuff that we did. Um, was never really a big sh- shoots guy. You know, we, we had, we, like I said, we went from being surface blockers to, I really, I was there through that whole evolution of the hands and face and, and all that aspect of it. And so um, I, I just kind of enjoyed teaching the details, part hat placement, hand placement, you know, first steps. I think anything that I could do where that got involved um, is probably what I enjoyed most. Okay. And, and the last question I got for you, Coach, I asked you a little bit earlier for advice for a line, but I, I mean, the real thing I like to ask when I, when I get to talking to head coaches who've been in it, especially who kind of spent a long time as an assistant and kind of had, had the two perspectives and, and had success. Do you have any advice, especially for younger coaches or young head coaches um, as they kind of enter this season or by the time we're in season when this comes out mid season, whatever, whatever this comes out, any advice for high school coaches and kind of, well, I would just say, you know, just, just be the same guy, you know, and I mean, kids, kids, they know uh, that, you know, and I think the positivity thing is something that sometimes it's, uh, you know, I've, I've heard some good stories about positivity, but just, just continue to write positive, you know, the, the, uh, trying to keep things in perspective. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I can just work as hard as you can work, try to work smart. Uh, let the kids know you love them and tell them that, you know, I think probably sometimes, uh, probably I look back, I probably hadn't told them enough. You know, and you get a little bit older, you get to my age, then I think you have a little bit more perspective, but uh, you know, and just finding something, you know, you hear it just with profession in general, but even with the football assets, find something you're passionate about, you know, and, 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 you know, maybe it's a scheme, maybe it's a certain thing, you know, and continuing to learn. And, uh, and I, I think probably the biggest piece of advice I give a young coach, in my opinion, you know, when you, young, I talked to a guy this week, you know, that, that we're maybe bringing him on in some type of a entry level type job, but it, it's uh, doing as much early in your career to be as diverse as you can be. And, you know, if I, you know, do you ever, I, I don't have a regret anything I've ever done. I look back, you know, when I look back early in my career. I love coaching the offensive line. I really, you know, being a head coach was never that, that wasn't just huge on my list of things to do. I felt like if I could do it at a place where I felt like I could do these things I wanted to do, then yeah. Um, but, but just, you know, as a young coach, learning as much as you can about the game and all aspects of it. And I remember Troy saying, when Troy left Wake Forest, he was with Jim Grove, who was the offense coordinator at Wake Forest, and they'd done some great things there. And he gets he gets hired at uh, he gets hired at the Broncos, and they hired him. And this would have been you know a number of years ago when they hired him as a they wanted an offensive guy on the defensive side of the ball. And you know and it was the same thing. You know what if we do this, what are you going to do? And he talks about that year he spent, and I think that's maybe the only year he spent on defense in his career because he's an offensive guy, but he always says that year he spent on defense, probably one of the best years he's ever, ever yeah. spent in all of his coaching years. And, uh, but, you know, just, again, trying to make yourself as valuable, uh, you know, because, you know, you'll be an offensive line coach, you'll be a division one offensive line coach. Or, well, there's only a hundred and some odd jobs of those in the country. Well, now I guess most people have, 
you know, the, the, the position assistance and all this stuff, but, but you just limit yourself, you know, just making yourself as valuable as you can by having as broad a spectrum as you can have. And, uh, I know I've kind of enjoyed, you know, and, and trying to hire guys like that. Okay. That was perfect coach. Now I, I appreciate you coming on. I really do. Like, this is fun. Uh, coaches, uh, two things, make sure one, you give coach a follow on Twitter Two, check out some firm in football. Um, like I said, you can find the spring clips and some stuff and highlights from their fall on YouTube. That's kind of, as I talked to coach, I mean, that's kind of where I prepped and kind of was able to pull some stuff. Obviously, I'd watch them at Air Force because, well, I enjoy watching service academies. Uh, like, share, subscribe, um, and check out our sponsor, Coach Pad. Uh, coach, thank you again. Hey, it's great being with you.